should be fine. And it says we are live and I just like to Carol, I just like to make sure that we are live because you know how Facebook is. So I do a little dance and look down and it's and we are live we are streaming um, on Facebook so thank you guys for joining us and you know because of my personal journey and the complexity of being a nonprofit professional again we're bringing to you the second annual mind body and soul nonprofit professional self care speaker series but first as some of you know my name is Sabrina and I'm the group administrator and the founder of Supporting World Hope, a nonprofit consulting company that I started after 25 years in the industry. You know, I started this group and the company to support nonprofit professionals who are often overworked, overwhelmed, and stressed out. And as many of you know, my story it led uh, to two different diagnoses of cancer, lymphoma, and uh, multiple myeloma. But today, today I am excited because today is January the 12th. And not only do we have a great uh, speaker and a great topic with Carol Gillespie Smallwood, today is my second birthday. Today, two years ago, I went into MD Anderson for my stem cell transplant. And so I am two years old on the inside. Uh, physically this month, I will turn 50, but today is my stem cell birthday and I am two years old. So I'm very excited to share this day um, with Carol Gillespie Smallwood and she's a transformational health coach and she's gonna be talking about self-care. Let's start with sleep. Personally, this is a challenge for me. So I just am so excited to hear about everything that Carol um, has to say. But before we get started, um, click the like or the heart button. If you can hear me loud and clear, if you have a question, please post the question in, in the comments. I like I ask that you, you know, click the heart and like button so that I can acknowledge that you're here, one, um, because that's the only way I know who is in the crowd. And two, it is going to help us with our Facebook algorithms um, to keep this feed at the top. Even if you're watching in replay, um, put hashtag replay, let us know where you're from. I always like to know where people are tuning in from. So um, with that in mind, uh, we will get going here. Um, but while Carol is sharing her screen, I am going to turn it over so that she is the host, so that she can share her screen. And while she is doing that, I am going to tell you a little bit about Carol. Um, so, Carol, let's get into it. Carol, first of all, how are you doing today? I am doing great. How are you, Sabrina? I am doing well uh, today as well. As you, as you just found out, today yeah. is my birthday. So, uh, <laughs> I get to celebrate two birthdays in January the stem cell transplant birthday, and then my physical birthday is January the 31st. So I'm just wow. excited. Well, um, I am thrilled to be sharing this special day with you. Thank you, thank you. And it's around such a topic that I, I, I confide in you that you know I struggle with uh, to this day. And I know a lot of people struggle with that topic and they need help around it. So, you know, it's just, I'm just so excited to have you. So I'm going to share a little bit about Carol and her bio. Uh, so Carol Smallwood is a certified transformational health coach with a master's degree in public health. Um, having worked in executive management for over 30 years, she, under, she understands putting your career before yourself and your health. Today, she works with professionals, who have tried to take charge of their own health, but fall short because they don't have a system, support or accountability to show them the way. She helps her clients get motivated to take action, gain control and confidence and change their health habits for good. Her passion and knowledge of health habits change allows her to guide professionals to make meaningful 
lasting changes in their health and the life and life without sacrificing what is important to them. And I will say this, Carol is a nonprofit professional, having served as a CEO of her organization um, for many, many years. So she knows firsthand what she's talking about and she knows firsthand what our struggles are. So with that, I would like to turn it over to Carol. Thank you so, so much. You know, I was sitting in my office after a disastrous board meeting and I just buried my head in my hands, feeling as low as I ever had. I felt like a complete failure. I expended all of my energy on my career. Work-life balance, I was overwhelmed, stressed out, and always exhausted. Oh, and instead of buttoning my pants, I had to use those little extenders to expand the waistline. You know, I found myself reaching into my secret junk food drawer more and more. My kryptonite, peanut M&Ms, Costco size. I felt out of control, foregoing a good night's sleep night after night as I was pulled by the siren song of my laptop or phone to just get this one last thing done. I knew I needed to take better care of myself, of my health, but I just couldn't find the motivation to do it. I knew something had to give, so I did something kind of radical. I enrolled in health coaching school. And over the next two and a half years, I studied and researched the best methods and techniques to take control of my life, put myself first, and reach my health goals. And through all of this, I found a better way. I designed my Create Your Healthy Habits Map program to help professionals get motivated to take control, put themselves first, reach their health goals, and avoid the mistakes I made. Oh, and the great thing, it won't take over two years for them to get there because they'll have a map. Today, instead of feeling out of control, I'm grounded. Instead of feeling overwhelmed, I am calm. And instead of exhausted, I'm full of energy. I put myself first so that I can be present for my career and others in my life. Oh, and I sleep like a baby. So in the next 45 minutes, I'm gonna share with you a few techniques to create your healthy habits map for a good night's sleep. Put yourself first and create habits that stick. The first step is M, motivation. Then we'll talk about A, action. And finally, you'll learn methods to make your habits permanent. That's your map. So let's start with motivation. First, Everyone tells you it's hard to get motivated to change a habit, but I'm here to tell you that it's not. Why? Well, because when you have a driving reason to make a change, you become one with that desire and it propels you. So we begin by determining your why, the reason deep down in your soul for wanting to make a change at this time. I call this your big motivating factor or your big mofa. I take my clients through an exercise to get th to that sole reason. But for now, take a minute to think about that driving reason deep down in your soul for wanting to change a habit, say, to get a consistently good night's sleep. And just write that down. Okay, once you've identified your big mofa, you want to create some little reminders so you just don't forget about it. And we do this by anchoring your big mofa. An anchor is something in your environment that will remind you why you're doing all of this, especially in the times when you don't feel like following through. It's like a little pattern interrupter, something that stops you like a little hiccup when you're tempted to make a choice which may not be in alignment with your outcomes. It's like answering you know, a few more emails or watching a movie to the end instead of heading for bed, because we have all done that. The anchor should be something sensory, like a picture on your phone, a piece of jewelry you wear, inspiring notes you place around the house, could be a song you sing, or even a beautiful smell. One of my anchors is a picture of my parents. See, they did not take very good care of themselves, and they're no longer with us. 
So when I get tempted to do something not in alignment with my health goals, I pull out this picture and I think about my daughter because I want to be here for her well into her adulthood. So what speaks to you? What do you hold special and dear? What reminds you of why you're doing this? Write down a few anchors that will be those little reminders for you and make them meaningful and sensory. Okay, that's our motivation. So now we're gonna move on to action. This is where we create small actionable steps around strategies to help you create your healthy habits. So how many of you put sleep near the end of your priority list? There's too much work. I have too many emails, so much responsibility. Just say me in the comments if you don't prioritize your sleep. And seriously, there's no judgment here. Sleep is essential for good health. In fact, we need sleep to survive, just like we need food and water. You know, it's no wonder we spend about one third of our lives sleeping. Sleep is a time when your body gets busy restoring and repairing itself. So if you've ever spent a night just tossing and turning, you already know how you feel the next day. You're tired, you're cranky, you're always hungry, and you're just kind of out of sorts. But missing out on the recommended seven to nine hours of sleep does more than make you feel groggy and grumpy. The long-term effects of inadequate sleep are real. It drains your mental abilities and puts your physical health at true risk. Science has linked poor sleep with a number of health problems from weight gain to a weakened immune system. Many biological processes happen during sleep. Your brain restores new information and gets rid of all the toxic wastes. Your nerve cells communicate and reorganize, which supports healthy brain function. And then the body repairs cells, restores energy, and releases molecules like hormones and proteins. These processes are critical for our overall health. And without them, our bodies cannot pro properly function. So let's take a closer look at why we sleep along with what happens if we don't get enough of it. There's still a lot we don't know about all the purposes of sleep, but we do know that there isn't just one explanation for why we need sleep. So let's talk about a few. First is repair. The body needs sleep to restore itself. Sleep allows cells to repair and regrow. That's when our muscles repair. Our cells build specific proteins. There's tissue growth and our home hormones are released for various restorative processes. Next is properly functioning brain and central nervous system function. Sleep is required for optimal brain performance. Your central nervous system is like the main information highway in your body. Chronic lack of sleep can disrupt how your body usually sends and processes information. When you're asleep, your brain system that performs waste clearance clears out all the waste from the central nervous system. It basically detoxes every night by removing the toxic byproducts from your brain that build up throughout the day. Now this allows your brain to work well when you wake up in the morning. Sleep also contributes to memory function by converting our short-term memories into long-term memories, as well as just by erasing or forgetting all that unneeded information that might otherwise just clutter in our nervous system. And when you don't get a good night's sleep, you may find it difficult to concentrate or learn new things. In addition, Lack of sleep negatively affects problem solving and decision making skills, as well as hinders our creativity. So think about these ways sleep maintains and sharpens our brains. As a nonprofit leader, how high a priority do you put on being sharp throughout the day? And now consider how high a priority do you put on getting a full night's sleep? Next is our emotional well being. During sleep, brain activity increases in areas that regulate emotion, thereby supporting our emotional stability. Now, one example of how sleep can regulate emotion occurs in the part of the brain in charge of the fear response, 
which controls your reaction when you face a perceived threat, like a stressful situation. So when you get enough sleep, you respond in an adaptive way. But when you're sleep deprived, you're way more likely to overreact. It's also likely you feel a little more impatient or prone to mood swings when you lack sleep. I think we can all attest to that. Let's talk about weight maintenance. Sleep affects your weight by controlling hunger hormones. These hormones include ghrelin, which increases your appetite, and leptin, which increases the feeling of being full after we eat. So during sleep, ghrelin decreases because you're using less energy than when you're awake. Lack of sleep, however, elevates ghrelin and suppresses the leptin. And that imbalance makes you hungrier, which may increase the risk of eating more calories and gaining weight. And recent research shows that chronic sleep deprivation, even as few as five consecutive nights of short sleep may be associated with risk of type two diabetes, obesity, and metabolic syndrome, which is a group of medical conditions present all at the same time. And that includes high blood pressure, low HDL, which is our good cholesterol levels, and excess abdominal fat. These all increase a person's risk of heart disease, stroke, and diabetes. And if you don't sleep enough, you may feel too tired to exercise. And over time, reduced physical activity can make you gain weight because you're not burning enough calories and you're not building that muscle mass. All right, next is proper insulin function. Inadequate sleep causes your body to release less insulin after you eat. Now, insulin is a hormone that helps your cells use glucose or sugar for energy and helps you reduce your blood sugar level. But with insulin resistance, your cells don't respond properly to insulin. That can lead to high blood glucose levels and eventually type two diabetes. Sleep may protect against this insulin resistance. It keeps your cells healthy so they can easily take up that glucose. And next is immunity. A healthy and strong immune system depends on sleep. At this time in our history, we all need a strong immune system. Inadequate sleep prevents your immune system from building up its forces. Your body may not be able to fend off invaders and it also takes you longer to recover from an illness. While you sleep, your immune system produces protective infection and in inflammation fighting substances like antibodies and small proteins. These small proteins also help you sleep giving your immune system more efficiency to defend against those illnesses. And it also produces antibodies and immune cells. And together, these molecules prevent sickness by destroying those harmful germs. That's why sleep is so important when you're sick or when you're stressed, because during these times, the body needs even more immune cells and proteins. Next is our cardiovascular system. Sleep affects processes that keeps your heart and your blood vessels healthy, including those that affect your blood sugar, blood pressure, and your inflammation levels. It also plays a vital role in your body's ability to heal and repair blood vessels and the heart. People who don't get enough sleep are more likely to get cardiovascular disease. One analysis linked insomnia to increased risk of heart attack and stroke. And then finally, the endocrine system. Hormone production is dependent upon your sleep. For testosterone production, you need at least three hours of uninterrupted sleep. So waking throughout the night could affect hormone production. There have been recent studies examining the impact of chronic partial sleep deprivation and hormone levels. Generally, cortisol, known as the stress hormone, decreases in the early evening, preparing the body for sleep. And researchers found that study participants who had partial sleep loss, meaning sleeping less than seven hours for six days, resulted in cortisol decreasing six times slower than those who slept seven to nine hours a night. 
these evening cortisol levels in chronic sleep loss can lead to insulin resistance, which as we know, is a risk factor for obesity and diabetes. So what happens if you don't get enough sleep? Let's take a look at this slide listing specific consequences of inadequate sleep. As I've already said, without adequate sleep, your body cannot function properly. Sleep deficiency is linked to chronic health problems affecting the heart, the kidneys, the blood, the brain, and our mental health. Lack of sleep is also associated with increased risk of injury. Driver drowsiness, for example, can contribute to serious car accidents and even death. A study conducted in 2000 found that moderate sleep deprivation produces impairments equivalent to those of alcohol intoxication. Older adults with poor sleep is associated with increased risk of falls and broken bones. So the consequences of an adequate sleep are detrimental to nonprofit leaders. To serve your organization, clients, staff, getting optimal sleep will allow you to perform at the top of your game. So what are the cycles of sleep? Your body goes through four stages of sleep, which generally repeat about four to six times during a seven to nine hour sleep period. The patterns include two major phases, non-rapid eye movement, non-REM, and then REM, rapid eye movement sleep. And as the name suggests, non-REM sleep features absence of eye movements, whereas REM sleep, when dreaming occurs, is characterized by rapid eye movements. When you fall asleep, your brain and body go through several cycles of these four distinct stages, N1. This is the first stage of sleep, and that's the period between being awake and falling asleep. N2 is the onset of sleep as you become unaware of your surroundings. Your body temperature drops slightly and your breathing and heart rate become regular. In N3, is, that's when the deepest and most restorative sleep occurs. That's when your breathing slows, your blood pressure drops, your muscles relax, your hormones are released, and healing occurs. That's when your body becomes re-energized. And then REM, that's the final stage and takes up about 25% of the sleep cycle. This is when your brain is most active and your dreams occur. REM sleeps help boost your mental and physical performance when you wake up. Now it takes on average about 90 minutes to go through each one of these cycles. So if you complete five cycles a night, you'd get about seven and a half hours of sleep. Six full cycles is about nine hours of sleep. So how much sleep do you need? Well, that changes throughout your lifetime. An infant may need up to 17 hours of sleep each day, while an older adult may get by on just about seven hours of sleep. But age-based guideline is really strictly that, a suggestion based on research of how much sleep you may need for optimal health as your body needs change. But the biggest question is how do you feel when you get the amount of sleep? Here's what to keep in mind when evaluating your own sleep needs. Do you feel rested after seven hours of sleep or do you think you need more? Are you tired throughout the day? Do you rely on coffee or sugar to get you going in the middle of the day? And if you sleep with somebody else, have they noticed that you're having sleep issues? So when you're beginning to determine the perfect amount of sleep that's best for you, I suggest you write down each morning the number of hours that you slept. Then in a journal or in your phone throughout the day, document how you feel starting with how you feel when you very first get out of bed. This will help you remember how your body reacts to various sleep times and helps you target the optimal number of hours of sleep you need to function at your best. So, excuse me, signs that you might not be getting enough sleep include drowsiness during the day, frequent yawning, irritableness or moodiness, you're less productive and completely unfocused. You are hungry all the time, your appetite's increased. 
and your judgment and decision making just aren't what they used to be. Now, the CDC and the American Academy of Pediatrics suggest the following sleep durations based on your age. So just find your age on the chart, and that's what they recommend. So how do you know when you should go to sleep each night? Well, for most of us, wake up time is a constant. What time you go to sleep, though, depends on your work schedule, your social life, family obligations, the newest show streaming on Netflix, or simply when you start to feel tired. But if you know what time you have to get up and you know the specific amount of sleep to function your best, you just need to figure out what time to go to bed. Now this slide provides the best time to go to bed based on your wake up time and your natural sleep cycles. So what if there was a way to easily fall asleep and get a good night's sleep? Well, you are so lucky to be here today because I'm going to give you 14 proven strategies to help you sleep better. So number one, increase bright light exposure during the day. One of the keys to feeling sleepy at night is to kick off your day with natural light. So if you get great morning sun in your bedroom, open up your blinds and just let it stream in. You want to get regular exposure to daylight for at least 20 minutes a day and try to get out in the sun first thing in the morning, even if it's only for a few minutes, because that tells your body that it's time to wake up. Your body has a natural timekeeping clock known as your circadian rhythm. It affects your brain, your body, and your hormones, and it helps you stay awake and tells your body when it's time to sleep. During the day, the light from the sun enters your eyes and triggers your brain to release specific chemicals and hormones like serotonin that are vital for boosting your mood and helping you feel calm and focused. At night, darker light triggers your brain to make another hormone, melatonin, which is responsible for helping you sleep. When you get in the sun first thing in the morning, it stops the flow of melatonin and sets your internal clock to keep you energized during the day and then helps you wind down at night. And one study found that people with insomnia when exposed to, exposed to daylight um, early in the day, the amount of time it took them to fall asleep reduced by 85%. It also improved their sleep quality and their duration. So try getting daily sunlight exposure, or if that's not possible for you, invest in getting one of those artificial bright light devices or bulbs. Number two, don't consume caffeine late in the day. Now caffeine has numerous benefits and it's consumed by 90% of the US population. A single serving can enhance your focus and your energy. But consuming caffeine up to six hours before bed can significantly worsen sleep quality. So when consumed late in the day, caffeine stimulates your nervous system and may stop your body from naturally relaxing at night. Caffeine can stay elevated in your blood for six to eight hours. Therefore, drinking large amounts of coffee or soda three to four, after three or four in the afternoon is really not recommended especially if you're sensitive to caffeine or if you have trouble sleeping. Next, if you struggle with sleep, try to get in the habit of waking up and going to bed at similar times each day. Why? Well, your body's circadian rhythm functions on a set loop, aligning itself with sunrise and sunset. So being consistent with going to bed and waking up can aid in long-term sleep quality. And one study noted that participants who had irregular sleep patterns and went to bed late on weekends reported consistent poor sleep. In addition, irregular sleep patterns can alter your circadian rhythm and the levels of melatonin, which signal your brain to sleep. See how all this starts going together? So after several consistent weeks of heading to bed and waking up at the same time, you might even find you don't even need alarm anymore. And you know, I had this problem with going to bed late on Friday and Saturday nights and sleeping in late on Saturday and Sundays. Well, Sunday night, I wasn't sleepy. 
That means I got to sleep later. I woke up on Monday morning, not fully rested. And that just started the cycle for the entire week. It wasn't until I started waking up and going to bed at the same time every day that now I get a wonderful night's sleep. All right. Next, if you have difficulty falling asleep, ask your healthcare provider if a melatonin supplement might be right for you. I touched on this a bit earlier. Melatonin is a key sleep hormone that tells your brain when it's time to relax and head for bed. In one study, taking two milligrams of melatonin before bed improved sleep quality and energy the next day, and it helped people fall asleep faster. It's also useful when traveling and adjusting to a new time zone because it helps your body's circadian rhythm return to normal. But again, check with your healthcare provider to see if melatonin supplement is right for you. And next, avoid alcohol. It may initially help you fall asleep, but it makes your sleep interrupted and of poor quality because it negatively affects your hormones. It alters nighttime melatonin production, as well as decreases the natural nighttime elevations in the human growth hormone, which along with melatonin, plays a key role, again, in your circadian rhythm as many other key functions. Alcohol is also known to cause or increase symptoms like sleep apnea, snoring, and disrupted sleep patterns. Number six, optimize your bedroom environment. Many people believe that bedroom environment and its setup are key features in getting a good night's sleep. So create an aesthetic environment in your bedroom that encourages sleep. For example, serene and restful colors and no clutter. External noise, often from traffic, can also cause poor sleep. So to optimize your bedroom environment, try to minimize external noise, light, and artificial lights from like alarm clocks. And consider using eye shades and earplugs. Make sure your bedroom is quiet, relaxing, clean, and an enjoyable space. And next, set your bedroom temperature. Body and bedroom temperature also profoundly affects sleep quality. As you may have experienced during the summer or in hot locations, it can be really hard to get a good night's sleep when you're too warm. So bedroom temperature can affect sleep quality more than external noise and it increase the amount of times you wake up every night. Most doctors recommend keeping the thermostat between 60 and 67 degrees Fahrenheit, although that depends on your preferences and your habits. Next, Take a relaxing bath or shower. Speaking of temperature, when you take a warm bath or shower before bed, it can help you fall asleep and improve your sleep quality even in the heat of summer. And the optimum time to take one might be an hour or two before going to bed. So why do hot baths work? Well, for the opposite reason most people think. You get to a hot bath and you get out and you think, oh, I'm all nice and toasty. I'm going to get into bed and I'm going to fall asleep because I'm warm. And the opposite is actually true. Our core body temperature changes throughout the day. We tend to gradually cool by evening before we go to sleep. So our body core temperature needs to drop by about two to three degrees to initiate a good night's sleep and then to maintain deep sleep. So enhancing that natural cooling of the body's core temperature may be a way to promote sleep. So what happens with a bath is you actually bring all of the blood to the surface. And for you to get heat out of the core of your body, you need to release it through the outer perimeter surfaces like your hands and your feet. They're, your hands and feet are wonderful heat radiators. So you're essentially coaxing the heat out of the core of your body to the surface. Now, if you don't wanna take a full bath at night, you can warm your tummy with a hot water bottle, which raises your core temperature. Next, don't eat late in the evening. Eating late at night may negatively affect both sleep quality 
and the natural release of human growth hormone and melatonin. So eat no later than two hours before bed. Eating a heavy meal prior to bed will lead to a bad night's sleep and it impedes the body's overnight detoxification process because it has to use all its energy digesting your meal instead of detoxifying. And next, get a comfortable mattress and pillow. Some people wonder why they always sleep better in a hotel. Well, it could be because the bed and the pillow quality can affect sleep. Poor quality bedding can lead to increased lower back pain. As a matter of fact, one study looked at the benefits of a new mattress for 28 days, and it reported that participants who slept on the new mattress had reduced back and shoulder pain and reduced back stiffness. It also improved their sleep quality by about 60%. So replacing your mattress or your pillow is something you can consider. And exercise regularly, but not before bed. Exercise is one of the best science-backed ways to improve your sleep and your health. It enhances all aspects of sleep and has been used to reduce symptoms of insomnia. One study in older adults determined that exercise nearly halved the amount of time it took to fall asleep and provided 41 more minutes of sleep a night. Although daily exercise is used for a good night's sleep, performing it too late in the day could cause sleep problems. And that's due to the stimulatory effects of exercise, which increase alertness and hormones like epinephrine and adrenaline. But that's not a problem for some people. So listen to what your body's telling you. And don't drink any liquids before bed. If you have to get up multiple times during the night to urinate, your sleep quality and your daytime energy is negatively affected, as is the release of hormones. And although hydration is vital for your health, it's wise to reduce your fluid intake late in the evening. So try not to drink any fluids one to two hours before going to bed. And you should use the bathroom right before you go to bed because that can decrease the um, chances of you're waking up in the middle of the night. And next is what I call the power down hour. Exposure to light during the day is beneficial, but nighttime exposure has the opposite effect. Again, this is due to the effects of your circadian rhythm. It tricks your brain into thinking it's still daytime. And it reduces the hormones like melatonin, which helps you sleep and get the deep sleep. Now, blue light, which um, electronic devices like TV, smartphones, and computers emit in large amounts is the worst when it comes to emitting blue light. I coach my clients to incorporate a pre-sleep routine that helps them relax. And I call it the power down hour. This includes turning off the TV, phone, computer, and tablet, and any bright lights at least one hour, preferably two, before heading to bed. During this time, relax, clear your mind. When performed consistently, it will signal your body that it's time to prepare for a good night's sleep. So try listening to music, read a good book, take that hot bath, do some deep breathing exercises and journal. And finally, end the day with positivity. At the end of your power down hour, write down everything on your mind. Get it down on paper. All of the things bothering you, your to-do list, work priorities, the three big things you wanna accomplish the next day, anything bouncing around in your brain. Now, all of those are safe on paper where you can look at them in the morning but for the night, you don't have to worry about them. That frees up your mind and energy to move into a deep and restful sleep. Then journal the answer to these four questions. What am I grateful for? What am I proud of? What did I do right today? And what do I want to attract? The bottom line is this, sleep plays a key priority in your health. And if you're interested in optimal health and well-being, it's recommended that you make sleep a top priority. And when applied correctly, the strategies I've offered today will help you get the sleep you need 
to be at the top of your game for your organization, your family, and for yourself. This list is not meant to overwhelm. Small actionable steps are the key to lasting habit change. Pick a few and start out with those. Find out what works for you. If after incorporating all of these strategies, you continue to have problems sleeping at night, talk to your healthcare provider. They can help test for underlying health conditions that might be getting in the way of your perfect night's sleep. Okay, we've talked about motivation. Now we just talked about action. Now we're gonna make your new habit permanent. And to do that, we need to build our intuition. And you're probably thinking, uh, Carol, how do we do that? Well, try my SNAP method. So the first step is to step back. You can use this with any goal, but today we're gonna to use the example of working past the time you need to go to bed because we have all done that. So when you find yourself logging onto your computer or reaching for your phone at your power down hour, step back and visualize yourself reaching for that keyboard or phone. We're working to break out of autopilot. What are your cues to reach for the device? What are your emotions? Are you fearful of something? Anxiety? Are you avoiding something? Are you stressed? Write it down. It's important to keep track of your emotions. Next, no judgment. Let go of judgment and replace it with curiosity. Let's face it. We are our own worst critics. Have you ever looked up at midnight, glassy eyed, having not been productive, even after working on something and just beating yourself up? Why did I do that? You are so stupid. Stop judging yourself. You know what that does? It leads to more unhealthy behavior. Your brain is a pleasure seeking machine. What happens when you're not taking care of yourself? Likely you start to beat yourself up. Your brain processes that as pain. It starts looking for pleasure again. And what's the easiest way to pleasure? Well, continuing to scroll on your phone or possibly reaching for junk food for comfort or energy. That reinforces the judgment. See, you are weak. You have no self-control. You're such a failure. Why even try? It's a cycle. And we're trying, you're, you're just reinforcing that behavior. So throw away judgment, approach it with curiosity, get curious. Isn't it interesting that I'm working late into the night, but I know I'm not being productive. I've reread the same paragraph 10 times and I still don't know what I've read. What am I worried about? Am I fearful? Am I frustrated? Am I trying to avoid something? Replacing judgment with curiosity is a game changer. You're breaking the cycle of the unhealthy behavior and then you're beating yourself up. The next step is to align. Ask yourself, does this behavior align with my why, my big motivating factor? Is this choice I'm making right now in alignment with my health goals? When you do that, it's likely you won't forego a good night's sleep because you're asking yourself, why do I wanna be healthy and is this in alignment with that? Okay, you're about to pick up your phone to answer just a couple more emails. You've stepped back, you've let go of judgment, and you're asking yourself, is this choice in alignment with my big MOFA? The next step is the most important one, and that is to P, provide. Provide your body with what it needs. Don't see your emotions as bad. All emotions are a gift. They're your body's way of telling you that you need something. I tell my clients, listen to your body's whispers before they turn into screams. Your body is seeking pleasure. It wants a good, safe, and a healthy choice. Ask the question, what feeling or emotion is coming up for me and what can I do to answer that? My client, Mona, had trouble not only falling asleep, but staying asleep. She woke up almost every night around 2 a.m. anxious about the upcoming day. She found that when she performed her power down hour, takes a warm bath, does her end of the day with positivity journaling, she doesn't go to bed filled with anxiety. 
when she lays her head down, she's relaxed and her mind is clear. She now consistently gets a good night's sleep. So the next time your brain automatically thinks, I'm just going to check my email one last time. Just say, oh, snap, and go through the snap exercise. Step back, no judgment, align, and provide. I hope you found this information helpful. You know how to find motivation to conquer your health goals. You have strategies for a good night's sleep. And now you know how to make your new habit permanent. That's your healthy habits map. One of the most common questions I get is, Carol, my life is one hurried mess. Can you still help me change my health habits? And the answer is yes. Whether you've never tried to change a habit, whether you've tried and failed to change a habit, or whether you've changed habits in the past, my program will help you change your healthy habits and make them stick. To help you set the stage for a good night's sleep, I'm offering to you my end the day with positivity seven day journal. My clients find that as simple as it sounds, it really works and they get a good night's sleep. You can go to cgshealthcoach.com backslash end the day with positivity to download that and start using it tonight. Picture day, when you have so much energy that you're able to give your organization the attention it deserves and have the energy to go for that long walk after work. Picture a day when a colleague comes up to you and says, you are on fire. There's a huge difference in you. What are you doing? And picture a day when you can look back on your whole life and know that you live without limitations, with focus and clarity. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed the rest of the upcoming speakers. Sabrina, what questions can I answer for you? I do have some questions. So let me um, see if we can bring you back up on screen. I think we're good. So one question is, and this, is, this makes me laugh is, can you catch up on sleep? It looks like we lost Sabrina. Oh, oh there she is. is. Yes. The, the one question I have is, can you- Oh, my sound went off. Just one second. Okay. I think this is a funny question. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, perfect. The question is, can you catch up on sleep? You can't catch up on sleep. It's not accumulate kind of thing. It needs to be consistent. So that's why when you don't sleep, um, when you sleep, when you don't go to bed at consistent times, all seven nights and you kind of don't get enough sleep during the week and you stay up, you, stay up late on weekends, it disrupts it for the whole week. So you can't catch up. You need to make that consistent. Okay. Okay. Uh, I have another question here. Um, the question is, what if you are a night owl by, by nature? How do you, how do, how do night owls get better sleep? It's all about the circadian rhythm. So when you go through the 14, one of the first things I would say is you need to set your consistent times for getting to bed because you know what time you have to get up to start your day. So work on that. It's a work in progress. It will take time. And then first thing in the morning, get out and get that sunlight. It sounds crazy, but that tells your body it's time to get up. It's time to wake up because you might, you have to reset that circadian rhythm and don't get into the habit of staying up late on those weekend nights. Try it for two weeks. Okay, try for a month, for a month. Try on the weekends to get up at the same time you do on weekdays. One thing I found is, oh my gosh, I have so much time in the morning to be productive on weekends because I didn't sleep my morning away. But that really did help me reset my circadian rhythm because I too was a night owl. So just try it for a month. but. When that sun comes up in the morning, I know it's a little different in the winter, but get out in that sunlight to reset that circadian rhythm. Okay. And this is gonna be our last question here. Um, what, um, let, me, let me make sure I read it correctly. Um, essential oils, does lavender really work? I think lavender works. So in my bath, so I take a bath every night 
And I actually use Epsom salts because Epsom salts has magnesium. Magnesium also relaxes you. And, and I, I get the Dr. Tom's lavender scent Epsom salts and I put that in my bath. So when I get out of the bath, I am completely relaxed. I also put some of the essential oils, um, lavender scent on my pillowcase. Oh, okay. If, was there anywhere else? This is the Sabrina question now, since you said that. I know I said last question, but is there anywhere else that you put lavender that might help? You could get some of the roll on and put it on your pulse points. Okay. And your pulse points are at your wrist, correct? Wrist, and you could put it on your temples. Okay, wrist and temples. Okay, great. That is good information um, to know. Thank you, Carol, so much. Um, I will make sure that we drop your contact um, into the comments so that everybody can um, sign up um, um, for, your, for your item and um, for your end of the day uh, with positive positivity. Um, and that's really our time. I know that there are such great questions. If you have any more questions, feel free to put them in the comments. I know that Carol will be more than willing um, to answer any questions uh, that you may have. Um, so Carol, I, I just do it, did want to make sure that you had the opportunity to have the last word um, at this point, if you had anything you wanted to add. Well, I just wanna thank you so much for having me. I so much appreciate it. And for nonprofit leaders, I know how hard your job is I know the pressures you're under, but it, I know it's hard to prioritize your sleep, but doing that, speaking from experience, you can serve your organization so much better when you are ready to hit the ground running every morning and can make it throughout the day, top of your game. So I hope you take some of the, the 14 steps and able to incorporate those. That is so true. So that is our time. Um, tomorrow, I invite you to Join us again at two o'clock. We're gonna be discussing a fitness and health through positive mindset. We're gonna have with us Susan um, hines Lovely, and she's a, a health and fitness coach. And I will leave you with this. Your mission matters and deserves to be highlighted in your community. Your mission matters and can be an inspiration to those who need it the most. Your mission matters and deserves to be funded at its fullest capacity. Again, thank you for joining us and I'll see you tomorrow at the same time. Y'all be blessed. I'm still screaming, screaming though. <laughs> so I think Carol, you're gonna have to end the stream for me since I made you the host. So just hit- All right. Yeah. Bye everybody. Bye everyone. <laughs>